You've probably heard the term ziggurat before. This is the style of temple that starts in the Uruk period and continues throughout the later periods of uh, Mesopotamia. A, a ziggurat is essentially a large platform with a temple on top of it. It's a step temple, essentially. The ziggurat at uh, Uruk, dedicated to the sky god Anu, you can see had a very large brick, mud brick platform um, with a plastered temple on top. The archaeologists found remains of the plaster and remains of some of the walls and the floor of the temple. So we have an idea of what it looked like. Right, now, the, as we're going to see from pictures, the plan of the temple is the same as the temples from Eridu, showing that cultural continuity. Throughout Mesopotamian history, this is about a thousand years later, you can see that the ziggurats become even more elaborate, multiple steps, until at Babylon, you probably had something like a six-stepped ziggurat. Um, some people think that the, the ziggurat at Uruk would have taken maybe thousands of people several years to build. Uh, and whenever you again see a monument like this that, that took an enormous amount of labor, right? people who had to make the bricks, bring the bricks to the site, construct the, the mound and the temple, uh, you're talking about some sort of organization and also motivation to get these people to build that structure. This is looking again from the other side at the ziggurat. You get an idea of the, of the size here. Um, and the, uh, there are other areas of the site that, again, have later occupation that can't be excavated. We don't know exactly uh, what was going on in some of the other areas in the Rook. Most of what we know comes from the central areas dedicated to Anu, and as we're going to see, the other precinct called the Ayana precinct. So here's another uh, example of, or another picture of that large ziggurat. It had a staircase going up to the temple. We know from later history in Mesopotamia this would not be a public space. Temples were only for priests and for the priests to engage in sacrifices and worship and other things that would need to have been done uh, on the temple. But this was not sort of, this was not like a church or a synagogue or a mosque today or, or a Buddhist temple where the public can come in uh, and worship when they want. This was a house of the God and the priests were the functionaries to take care of the god, essentially. A lot of these buttresses you can see here on the temple probably created a nice uh, pattern of, of light and shadow when the, the sun was at a certain angle. Okay, let's look a little bit more at uh, the temple. There would have been a canal against dividing you know, the city, going right through uh, the city. You see the same plan that you would have seen in Eridu. The plan essentially consists of an open central room with an offering table and an altar at the other end flanked by other uh, rooms. Um, the, the, uh, here you can see a reconstruction of the temple. They recently had a exhibit on the Rook and uh, in that exhibit uh, they had this um, group that does 3D reconstructions uh, do all sorts of reconstructions of some of these ancient buildings to show what it would have looked like. So you would have had an offering table, you would have had an altar. At the altar is probably where the image of the God would have been placed. We'll see this from later Mesopotamian temples Priests would have laid out sacrifices on the offering table uh, for the god. Uh, it might have looked something like this. You know, we only have the foundations. You can see what was left, right? It's, you know, a couple of meters high. It doesn't, it's not perfectly preserved. And so the other parts are kind of guesswork by uh, archaeologists. Okay. It has a volume. You can see here the Anu Ziggurat, 37 thousand meters square 
Um, that is really, really large. They're talking about here at least 94,000 person days um, <clears throat> labor or, you know, we're talking. So essentially it's saying that uh, if you're trying to construct this in, let's say, 50 days, it would take you 1,800 laborers. Uh, if you're trying to construct in 100 days, it would have taken you 940 uh, labor. So this probably was constructed over an extended period with hundreds of workers. Now, some people would say this shows that the temple, that is the institution of the temple, is becoming more powerful. They're able to draw up more people. They, they have the organization. They have the wealth in terms of food surplus to pay workers. Uh, that's what many people believe. It can be argued, though. <coughs> right next to the ziggurat is this temple made out of limestone. Now, remember, there's no limestone in southern Mesopotamia. They had to go and acquire this stone from about 60 kilometers away and transport it back to southern Mesopotamia, showing, again, trade or the, at least the acquirement of resources that they didn't have. There's that limestone building. Okay, and this is what it might have looked like with, at that Anu ziggurat. Now, if you went across that tributary dividing the city to the other side, you then would have entered what's known as the Ayana precinct, which was not one major ziggurat, but was actually uh, composed of several different buildings that were important, as we'll see, but probably had different purposes. And there doesn't really look like there is a clear temple here. These buildings might have been used for something else. All right, now let's learn a little bit of ancient Sumerian. Sumerian is uh, good languages we're going to see for the kind of writing system that developed, or they had developed an appropriate kind of writing system for the language because many of the uh, words in Sumerian are one syllable or, or two syllable words, uh, and then maybe combinations of those words. So, Aana. A is house. A Ana is heaven. And Nin is lady. We know from later time periods that this area was dedicated to the god goddess Inanna, who is later known in mythology as Ishtar. Right? So Aana, the area, is the house of heaven. Inanna is the lady of heaven, right? Inanna is usually depicted on the back of a lion. Maybe sometimes she'll just have one foot on a lion, some sort of weapon like an axe, arrows or spears coming off her back, wings, as we're going to see, these horns. This is from a later time period than the Uruk period. We'll see some other symbols of Inanna from the Uruk period. Right? But later on, uh, gods are depicted with horned helmets or horned hats, as you can see here. Inanna was not a fertility goddess. She was the goddess of love, specifically sexual desire and warfare. Right, So sex and violence, essentially. She was not a mother goddess. She was not a fertility goddess. She was uh, associated with what we know as the planet Venus, um, which, you know, back then would have been a purple star um, that would have appeared in the sky at certain times. Okay, now archaeologists found essentially the lower courses of the foundations and first story of many of these buildings. But the buildings were dismantled after the Uruk period, <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why they don't have a lot of the uh, the walls left, but they can interpret some of the functions by uh, the layout of the buildings and what was found there. Okay, uh, you can see some of the major buildings from the Aana precinct. You had a couple of very long tripartite uh, buildings. You had a great court. You had a limestone temple, right? So again, another building that was made from a substance that doesn't occur there. We're going to look at uh, building C, we're going to look at the pillared hall, and we're going to look at the stone cone building. Uh, they didn't have very large pieces of wood to serve as roof beams. So if they wanted to build a large building, like in building E, you can see it's like uh, taking four building C's around a courtyard. 
This is what it looked like as they were excavating it. So in many cases, just the foundations and lower courses, but we still get information about what's going on in terms of the architecture. Okay, that white temple to Anu at the ziggurat, um, in terms of its space inside, could not accommodate a lot of people, maybe 10 to 14 people. Uh, however, Building C here in the Anu precinct could seat about 300 people. So they think that many of these large buildings might have had a different um, function than something like a ziggurat. Maybe these were kind of like the city government or where administration occurred. As we'll see, there's evidence of craft specialization in this area. So this might have had a more uh, economic uh, function. This is a, a nice reconstruction that they did. Um, of building C, I'm going to kind of skip through it a little bit, but you can see the main hall. Again, it's built on the tripartite plan. To make it even bigger, what they did is they added another tripartite building on the back. And many of these buildings, as we're going to see, were decorated with some of the earliest mosaics in history. Uh, that is, with little cones of clay or stone that were colored, that were pushed into the plaster, creating uh, beautiful mosaics. Okay, let's take a look now at the Pillared Hall. The Pillared Hall, uh, they think, had, had these four uh, pillars and four openings on either side as a way of people to access one courtyard uh, to the other courtyard. The Pillared Hall was also decorated um, with... Um, well, it's one of the earliest buildings that has freestanding pillars to hold up the roof. It was also decorated with these uh, cones, and it was actually painted on the outside this kind of uh, orangish uh, color. Um, because the roof beams, again, weren't large, they had to have these pillars to support the roof. Okay, so let's take a little look in the pillared hall right so we would be going from into the courtyard all of these areas right were decorated with these little cones we're going to look at how this how these kinds of mosaics are made inside you know you would have been able to access the other side of the pillar hall into the other courtyard this is maybe what it looked like uh, inside and you can see those little cones decorating uh, the outside here so it's providing access from one area to another area this is the great sunken court which had a waterway that brought water to uh, help trees that grew in essentially like a garden area okay let's look at the stone cone building so here you have cone decorations but they're actually uh, made of stone and see kind of how the that decoration looked okay so here's the layout again it would have been that sort of tripartite plan they did a lot of work on the foundation using you could see stone and also some of the asphalt um, building it up that l-shaped area probably contained water uh, so they they preserved it you know, using asphalt and then built it up and you can see they put these little clay things inside of the walls to help with the stone cones the cone decoration is a little bit like light bright if you ever play with light bright as a kid except no lights you know, these are little pegs that you use to stick you can see here into the plaster and you can make all sorts of decorations one of these buildings has something like 200 different kinds of decorations right? and you can see just how beautiful it would have looked and on the inside there looks like there was a hearth but also that l-shaped area had uh, water as you can see there um, and all of these stones uh, cones were made out of stone and the wall that surrounded the stone cone building also was decorated with uh, these cone mosaics all right, so what do we, how do we interpret these cone mosaics? What do they tell us? Well, if they're made of clay or they're made of stone, what they show is that these buildings were very important. Think of the labor that's going into decorating these buildings. And this is highly visible decoration. Um, so this is a demonstration to everyone that these buildings are important. They're being invested with a lot of labor. Um, you know, this is how we sort of calculate things in the ancient world. Uh, something might be uh, 
valued because it's made from a precious substance like gold, but something else might also be valued because a lot of labor went in to produce it. You can see, you know, each cone is only a f you know, few inches in length, maybe something like two inches. Um, and it would take a lot of time, cone after cone, pushed into the wet plaster to create these kinds of decorations. Some were decorated like little rosettes, but you can see that a lot of the areas of the Ayana precinct still have the cone decorations preserved. Um, so anytime we see cones and archaeological at the Rook period archaeological site, we can kind of uh, assume that there was probably some important public building there. Okay, one last building we'll look at in the Ayana area. We don't have a nice cool 3D reconstruction, but in this painting, it's probably this right here called the Great Hall. The Great Hall has a lot of deep buttresses you can see here, but it's a very has a very narrow central room. And uh, some archaeologists believe it was built this way to support some sort of archway over it. And it might have been trying to imitate the mudif, the reed uh, halls that you see in the marshes that were the assembly chambers for the sheikhs or the, the head people uh, of the villages. This is what a mudif would look like inside today. You can see those huge reed pillars that are holding up this vaulted uh, roof. So maybe that was another kind of assembly hall. What they also found in the Ayana precinct, as we're going to talk about next week, is most of the samples of writing from this period come from the Ayana area. So we're going to see the kinds of writing that was found in the Aeon area and talk about maybe why writing was developed in the first place. But we also have evidence for crafts like metals. So we have metal smelting and smelting is extracting the copper from the ore through heat. Right? Then you would heat it up again and pour it into molds and cast it. But before you can even do that, you have to take the ore and you have to smelt it. Use heat, and you can see here the way they got those high temperatures, uh, they didn't have bellows then. They would have just blown with tubes into the fire to feed it more oxygen, get really high temperatures. The copper would have melted out from the ore, uh, and then you could have taken that copper, melted it down again in a crucible, and then poured it into molds. So we, again, no metals found in southern Mesopotamia. They had to get the metals from somewhere else. They brought it back to a rook and then they smelt it and they produced things out of the metal. And they found these fire troughs uh, in the Aeon precinct where they were producing metals. They found other areas of um, the Aeon precinct where they were working with a red stone known as carnelian, which again does not exist in southern Mesopotamia, had to be brought in to trade. So we have production of goods, of prestige goods, in the Ayana area. We have areas probably where there was storage of food, we're assuming. Um, and we also have areas with lots and lots of evidence, as we'll talk about, of pottery production. Okay, so the Ayana area, right, when you put it together with the Anu ziggurat, you put it all together, what you see, uh, and we know this area was you know, later important to Inanna. So it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a good hypothesis that at this time it was also dedicated to Inanna, that essentially we see that the temples are the most important institution in the Uruk period, just like they were in the Ubaid period. Uh, and there's lots of different things going on at the temples besides religious worship. Uh, there's economic activities, there's storage, there's administration found on tax. There's craft production, right? So the temples are religious, but they're also political. Right? They are probably the government and they're also economic, right? So it's almost like some people think of it almost like a temple state, but they're not exactly sure 
if that's really an accurate way to describe it. But until we have other information, it looks like the temple is the most important institution in Mesopotamia at this time. And it was multifunctional, economic, it was um, religious, and it was political or administrative. Okay, now what we don't have in the Rook from excavations are households of people. So we don't really know about the everyday people, how they lived, what a neighborhood looked like, you know, domestic structures and things like that. That still has to be done at a Rook. We do have information about the important buildings in the center. Right. Now, during the Uruk period is when the wheel was developed. Uh, the wheel has multiple uses, uh, not just for uh, vehicles, but it actually has purposes beyond uh, wheeled vehicles. Now, there are depictions of wheeled vehicles in some of the writing tablets that we have in the Uruk period. That's our evidence that they were using the wheel for things like wagons. But we also have evidence that they were using them for drills, and they were also using them for pottery. Uh, and this was a big innovation. They couldn't make vessels from scratch, that is from a lump of clay, and throw it on a wheel like you would do today in a pottery studio. You know, at first, the beginnings of the use of the wheel, the wheels were not quite fast enough to throw that lump of clay on the wheel and to pull it up and turn it into a vessel. The way they used it first, and again, the Ayana precinct, they found thick layers of waste products from pottery kilns. But what they used the wheel first uh, for was to... Um, help them make vessels faster and also to trim and thin out the walls of the vessel right so in a pottery studio today you take a lump of clay that wheel would be spinning really fast and you would pull up and you would pull the clay up back in the Uruk period uh, what you would do is you would spin the wheel as you were laying the coils down, which would make things go a lot faster. You would also spin the wheel really fast and take a tool and take off excess clay uh, on the outside and the inside so that you could make a vessel that had thin walls, was lighter, uh, was more pleasing, was a better product, right? So you can see here, this is what an Uruk uh, wheel made, uh, quote unquote, vessel looked like. Now, in the next period, the wheels get faster and better and at that point, they're able to use the wheel to mass produce pottery on a large scale. But what about mass production in the Uruk period? Well, in the Uruk period, 75% of all the pottery that's found are these really ugly things called beveled rim bowls because they have a beveled rim. Again, archaeologists are not that creative when it comes to naming things or BRBs for short. Um, and where the site I worked in, we found a lot of BRBs. Um, a lot of times these bevel rim bowls, uh, when they are found in trash deposits, are found unbroken. Uh, which means that they were thrown away, but they could have actually been used again. So used, not used again, or recycled, just thrown away. So how would we describe these vessels? We might say that they were disposable. Uh, they were used once and thrown away. Uh, they were containers. They, it, they, were you, they were made to be disposable. They were not made by coils. The way they were made is either by a mold or a pit. So that is, they would dig a hole in the ground. They'd slap in a big slab of clay. They'd pull it out and they'd fire it in the kiln. Um, so they would make these really, really quickly. Uh, they were not meant to have a lot of time invested uh, in them. Now, why would they need a very, very large number of disposable containers? Well, a lot of people believe that what they were used for is to distribute rations to workers. Right? That is... You know, you're called up for your national service, quote unquote, 
and you're going to help build the temple to the sky god Anu or rebuild it or add more onto it. Um, and, you know, you expect to be paid. Um, and so at the end of the day, after your work is over, you'd line up and the temple officials would take a bevel ram bowl and they'd scoop out some barley and they would um, give it to you. You'd go home, you'd take that barley, put it in your house, and then you would throw away the bevel rim bowl, right? So 75% of all the pottery found are these bevel rim bowls. Um, and in fact, there's other evidence to support that. When we see, when we start looking at writing, what we'll see is the earliest writing. You can see this picture of a head means a person. The picture of food or bread is a picture of something that looks like a bevel rim bowl. Now, the picture of a head with the bowl together can mean two things. It can either mean to eat, right, which, you know, makes sense. You know, head, a bowl, um, you know, food to eat. Or it also means in the context on these tablets to distribute rations to workers. So... It looks like the Uruk people, you know, they had the wheel, but it wasn't good for producing lots of vessels. So they came up with another idea and they produced velvet bowls and they produced these bowls in large quantities so that they could basically uh, hire workers and pay them. We also have scientific evidence for beer at this point. Beer and civilization go hand in hand. Just the other day, they found another ancient brewery in Egypt. They think it might be the oldest brewery ever found in Egypt. Why is beer uh, a good thing to drink in a city? I guess it helps you deal with the stress of living in the city, but also, you know, when you've got 50,000 people defecating every day, uh, it's, it's safe to say that a lot of that fecal matter is going to end up in the rivers. And you don't want to drink the water from the rivers because you will easily get cholera, typhoid, schistosomiasis, all sorts of other nasty illnesses. However, if you're drinking beer, even with a 3% alcohol content, it will kill off any of those things that will make you sick. Um, and beer at this point was pretty easily made. They would take the barley, it would be in a vat, filled with water the barley would start to malt or germinate the complex carbs because it started to germinate would start to break down into simple sugars geese that landed there would then be able to start eating at the sugars and produce alcohol and these are some drinking scenes you can see from ancient mesopotamia so uh you know beer was probably a necessity in the ancient world in ancient egypt and in ancient mesopotamia People like beer, uh, we know from later Mesopotamian writing, but also it was probably healthier to drink the beer than it was to drink uh, the water. So it was a drinking supply for the people. Okay, now we're going to look at some of the evidence for leaders during uh, the Uruk period.